Van Nordstrom, and she is an RN from Toronto, and she is also an acromegaly patient, and she's going to speak to us about her adventure after being diagnosed with acromegaly. Hi everybody, I am so excited and grateful to be here uh, to tell my story. Um, grateful to Pfizer now for, for bringing me here. Um, and very honored to speak to fellow acromegaly, let's say sufferers, I don't think it's necessarily a suffering for a, a lot of the time. Um, but I just thought I'd share with you my kind of journey with acromegaly and uh, sometimes misguided, um, sometimes a bit frustrating and definitely a long journey but all the same um, for me it's kind of been an amazing journey and uh, I actually feel very lucky to be honest. Ironically, um, oh, it's skipping slides, okay, sorry. Um, ironically, I was actually born prematurely, uh, about two and a half months, and the doctors said that I was never gonna grow above five feet. Hmm. How strange things turn out. Um, so, and they also said I was gonna be slow, which we can talk about that later. <laughs> um, despite that, obviously you can see I, uh, I'm almost six feet and I uh, kind of fought back and I was always tall as a teenager um, but of course my father was uh, six foot six and, and a tall man so of course I was going to be tall, of course I was going to be big and I actually had big feet to begin with as well so that was uh, something that maybe did um, send people off in the wrong direction when they were trying to diagnose me. Um, and. So when I was 14, um, my phys ed teacher called me a lump of lard to my face. Um, basically said that I would never amount to anything in, in physical education, in sports. Um, she wrote on my report card that I had a silly attitude to phys ed and, and I had to learn how to control myself. Well, I actually still have a very silly attitude to phys ed and I've never learned how to control myself, but uh, I'm definitely not a lump of lard. Um, it actually took uh, 20 years for me to kind of get over that. I, I believed this woman, you know, teaches a, a great influence on you and, and whether that be a positive thing or a negative thing. In this case, it was a very negative thing, but uh, I believed her. But then, um, in 1999, I was uh, working at a sport injury clinic as a nurse, and uh, I'd actually just found out my boyfriend at the time was cheating on me, and I just left him a message saying, hi, Paul, it's Paula. Um, I thought we had something really special. Um, but what I really think is you're a big fat hairy line, something, and you're dumped. Goodbye. And I put the phone down. And then I look down at myself and I'm like, how did I get to this place? I was 240 pounds. I was sad, unhappy, and unhealthy, and it, I had to do something about this. Just at that moment, this woman walked into the clinic and she's clutching her knee. And she's like, I've done something to my knee and I need to see the doctor and I'm doing a triathlon in seven weeks time and I need help. And I look at her and she just looks like a normal person, like a, an average healthy person. And but first of all, I was, what's a triathlon? And she said, oh, it's swimming and biking and running. It's a race. And then I thought back and I'd seen something on TV a few weeks before and it was the Hawaii Ironman, the, the world championships with the, the fastest triathletes in the world and people crawling across the finish line and, and people collapsing and, and being taken off in ambulances and it, and it was ridiculous. It was a four kilometer swim and a, a 180 kilometer bike ride and a, a 42 kilometer run. And I'm like, that is insane. And she's like, oh no, she says, it's, that's not what I'm doing. I'm doing a short triathlon, it's much more sane. 
and she taught me a 750 meter swim, a 30 kilometer bike, and a, a seven kilometer run. Deep down somewhere in my sad, kind of overweight body, I, I thought, I could do that. And the next night I went for my first swim, and first swim in 15 years, and almost drowned, and literally was rescued, and the lifeguard told me, you know, you weren't breathing, you know, I was literally on the poolside in recovery position when I came to, and he gave me some hints on how to actually take a breath while you're, you're swimming. So I, I started from pretty low. The next night I went for my first run and I ran like the wind, all 240 pounds of me, and lasted for about half a block and then collapsed and crawled home. Went to the sport injury physician's office the next day and, and basically told him I was in pain from head to toe and this is what I'd done. And he said, well, next time, you know, run a minute, walk a minute, get rid of the tennis shoes, get some proper running shoes and you'll be fine. Seven weeks later, I did that sprint triathlon, that short distance triathlon and, and I crossed that finish line and my life basically changed right then because I really thought, you know, if I put my mind to something, I can do whatever I want. And, and so I, I started on this little journey with triathlon. And over the next few years, so that was 99, I increased the distances and uh, knew actually over the years that I was getting faster and I was losing weight, but I was never able to, considering the amount of exercise I was doing, I was never able to lose the, the weight that I should have. I, I was always, you know, I looked very muscular, I looked very healthy, but I knew there was something wrong. And I kept going to my doctor and saying that I had all of these, I don't know, I was like tired and uh, in pain. And, but I was training, so of course I was gonna have all these symptoms. So this is basically things began to change. Um, and I think it was around about when I started triathlons. I, I noticed um, that my feet were getting bigger. Um, my feet actually grew from a size already huge, like so unfair because I had big enough feet to begin with, but um, they went from uh, a size 11 to a size 13 wide. Um, the podiatrist that I went to see said, oh, it's because you started running and um, your feet have flattened and, and that's why you're having to buy bigger shoes. Um, but just wear men's shoes and, uh, and I'll make you some orthotics and they'll make you feel better. So they cost me $650 and, and that really wasn't the issue here. Obviously it was, uh, why were my feet getting bigger? So... My hands grew, um, but I didn't wear rings, so I didn't really notice that, to be honest. Uh, my face changed, my, my nose got wider, you know, my jaw got wider, I had um, pain in my jaw. I had, I think, what looked more like a chiseled athletic look, which kind of came along with the athletic um, activities that I was doing, so I didn't really think anything of that. Um, but I got taller as well, actually. I, I got taller. I don't know if anybody else did. I, I actually grew an inch and a half, and I guess that's probably unusual, but I did, um, and nobody could explain that one. Um, so <clears throat> one of the big things was joint pain. Um, just constant aching in all of my joints and I'd go to my doctor and she'd say but Paula you're the fittest person I know and and of course you've got joint pain you're exercising all the time um, I actually considered a change in career and, and I was thinking about doing massage therapy but the pain in my joints and my hands particularly um, swayed me from that thought um, and my poor husband um, who I actually met in 2003 when I did my first Ironman, so that crazy distance that I thought nobody should ever do. Well, I ended up doing that. Um, 
I, I picked a match around the race, actually. I'm, I'm good. I, I don't just do a triathlon or an Ironman. I actually pick a guy up during the race. I, you know, I like to... I like to... Uh, take things by the bull of the horns or the bull by the horns or whatever um, but he would hold my hand and I would say why are you squeezing my hand so tight and actually he wasn't, he was being quite gentle just, I was really sensitive so another symptom that the, uh, the doctor um, touched upon um, was lactation so I, I actually had I was lactating and with no pregnancy and no any of that to explain it. So my endocrinologist, sorry, my GP sent me to an endocrinologist who actually she ordered all of the right tests. She tested my prolactin levels. She she tested my growth hormone levels, um, but something got missed. Um, and I don't know if it was maybe because I was athletic and I was exercising and that can raise your growth hormone levels. It might have thrown a little bit of a red herring into the, the picture. But for some reason she ignored the fact that my growth hormone levels were 17 times over the normal. So that was a little bit upsetting when I found out about that, as you can imagine, uh, especially when it's like right in front of you. Um, <clears throat> Two years later, more pain, more complaints, uh, doctors telling me that it was all in my head. It was. And I'm sure there's a few people in this room that uh, can empathize with that one, like how many doctors have said, it's, it's all in your head, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Everybody uh, treating individual symptoms, nobody putting the, the, the big picture together. Um, very frustrating. Another thing, I had an insatiable appetite. I was constantly hungry. And an all-you-can-eat buffet was my heaven and the poor restaurant owner's hell if I walked in because I could probably put them out of business very easily <laughs> and I only stopped eating because I knew that I shouldn't be eating all the calories I, I knew there was a certain limit to how much but my stomach could just take it and, and, and the fact that I was exercising I was able to burn off the, a lot of the energy thank god I was training for Ironman because I don't think any just any exercise would have kept up with that so in another symptom, I had gaps in my teeth. Um, my jaw was changing. Um, I complained to my dentist because food was getting stuck in my teeth and he didn't kind of question why this was happening. Like the same dentist that I've been seeing for years and you know, obviously he can see the changes on my x-rays and stuff, but um, he just suggested I use special brushes to clean in between the teeth. and we go. I, uh, I was getting married, so John that I met in 2003 at my first Ironman, um, we ended up going to get married and I needed shoes for my wedding. So I go to the specialty shoe store in Toronto, walk in, pick up a pair of sandals. The guy behind the counter was like, oh, they'll never fit you. And so I sandal down, pick up another, not even close, he says, and uh, I'm kind of starting to get a bit disheartened, because I know that my feet are big, but this is a specialty shoe store, and I, I said to him, I said, can you maybe suggest something that's going to fit, as opposed to what's not going to fit, because I'm getting married in three weeks' time, and I really need shoes, and he gives me one of those ups and downs, and says, we don't have anything here for you, so I left the store crying, and Ended up getting married in my bare feet. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> right on, you know. Luckily, um, you know, my, my husband is a little bit shorter than me, so the fact that I wasn't wearing high heels was a bonus. <laughs> um, you know, you've got to look at the glass half full. <laughs> um, and 
this is actually the dock that we got married on. Uh, this is at my in-laws' um, farm. They have a little lake, and, and we, we actually built the dock together. That was one of the first things we did after we met at the Ironman. So getting married on, on the dock, in my bare feet, it was meant to be. It was, you know, it was like it was meant to be. Um, so, this was me um, about, I guess, a few a couple of months before I was diagnosed. And you can see increased prominence in my forehead and widening of my facial features, a wider nose, gaps in my teeth a bit. Can't really see on the photo, but there was, there was, there was gaps. I don't know if you can see any spinach or anything. Anyway, um, swelling, puffiness, um, could never really get to a good race weight. You know, we like to be nice and slim and, and not carry too much weight or pills on our bikes, but I could just never. But, the, I mean, there were other things. My, my skin was a lot thicker, so I could pick up hot potatoes out of the oven. I was like superwoman. I don't suggest any of you try this at home, okay? Just, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm normal, but um, I was taking it. And then people that I train with are like, Paula, are you on steroids or something? Because I had, you know, I was like pumped and, and, you know, I was getting, my muscle mass was a little disproportionate to the amount of weight training that I wasn't doing. I'd literally just swim, bike and run, but I looked like a, a bodybuilder. But um, this is all happening while I'm working, ironically, again, there's a lot of irony in this, but uh, working in uh, diabetes research, I'm a, a research nurse, and I was surrounded by endocrinologists and experts in pituitary, and, uh, and actually the day before I got diagnosed, um, every Tuesday at, at work we have uh, what's called endocrine rounds, so it's basically educational rounds at the hospital, and it's three different hospitals get together, and somebody is a guest speaker, and, and they pick a topic in the endocrine world, and, and the topic was all about acromegaly. So I'm sitting in this room with, uh, you know, this presenter talking about how difficult it is to diagnose, di uh, diagnose acromegaly and, you know, sitting there eating my pizza. The only reason I used to go to these educational sessions was actually for the free lunch that they provided. But it was very interesting. I'm like, oh, that's very interesting. And just not thinking and, and you know, being sitting next to... Uh, Shireen Izzat, who was actually my endocrinologist, who I uh, work um, along the corridor from him, um, and he's like, hmm, nobody's seeing this giant in the room with them. Very strange. It's uh, an interesting world, and, and all these little clues that kind of prod us. So for me, the, the trigger or the, uh, the thing that sent me to the hospital for real this time was a horrible like shooting pain. I just kind of put it down to stress or allergies or... But uh, this one was, I literally could not ignore it. It was so shocking. I would drop whatever I was holding or... I'd, I'd almost collapsed, so I walked over to the um, the emergency department of the hospital that I work at, and in within about three or four hours, they had diagnosed me with uh, diabetes, sleep apnea, arthritis, an enlarged heart, and my a pituitary tumor that was actually hemorrhaging. So it was good, though. It was. You know what, as shocking as it was, it was a massive relief. It was, you know, finally a diagnosis. Um, it, you know, it wasn't all in my head. It was, it was actually very real and, uh, and there was something that could be done about it. Um, I got home from the hospital and uh, 
immediately Googled acromegaly, pituitary tumour. And I have to say, you know, you, you go into Wikipedia or whatever and the, the pictures are, you know, Andre the Giant and, and Jaws, the character actors that have really kind of extreme cases of acromegaly. This is six months after I'd been gotten married to, to John and, and I'm sitting and I'm crying my eyes out. Johnny, what did you ever see in me? You've married a monster. And his response, he was wonderful. He, he's Paula, Paula, Paula. I didn't marry you for your looks. I married you for your money. <laughs> I don't have any money. Just, just <laughs> as well. <laughs> he, he, so he, he held my hand through this process and, and just kind of made me laugh. Although sometimes I wanted to not laugh. But um, I was glad to have him there to kind of jolly me along and keep it real. So basically the, the diagnosis, the, the hemorrhage, um, and that was when I was introduced formally to the endocrinologist that I would say hi to in the corridor. And, and it's a bit mad because when he saw my blood results before he actually put my name to the, and, and face to the diagnosis, but he walked into the room and it was like he was almost getting ready to, because he sees all of the acromegaly patients in Ontario. Um, and he walks in, he's like, well, 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 look what we have here, an acromegalic. And I'm like, actually, I'm a person. And, and I started to cry again. I do lots of crying, but um, I was like, I sat next to you in endocrine rounds um, a few weeks ago, and, and we talked about acromegaly at that session. and. How come you didn't see it then if it's so obvious now? And he said, well, no, he said it's more the, the blood result. He kind of did a bit of backpedaling. So, but it was just that kind of, I'm feeling really sensitive right now. Please be nice to me. Uh, so I uh, had all of the blood tests performed, um, all of the testing that, uh, what's the doctor's name? The one that just came to he was wonderful. Um, he explained all of the testing, so I don't need to get into any of the details, um, but had all the testing that you have probably all, uh, lots of you, experienced. Um, and uh, my nurse introduced me to another acromegalic patient at the time of my testing, so that you know, somebody who has already been through this for a few years, um, so a body system, which actually was amazing, and she continues that. And I'm now a body to a few people, and funny enough, I'd often go and visit Laurie, my nurse, because she's in the same hospital as me. And I'd, I'd just pop in and take her a coffee or whatever, and, uh, and there she would be with a patient who's going through their testing, so it worked out really nicely. I would be able to kind of tell them my story and, and tell them some funny stories along with uh, the, the serious stuff. But uh, I think it's, it's really nice to be able to have somebody to sh share it all with and, and somebody that certainly walked in those shoes. Um, it's rare, but I don't think it's as rare as, as we think it is. Uh, I don't know about you all, but once you know about acromegaly, you see people on the street. Um, so it, it is nice to feel that uh, you're not alone. So that was uh, actually not my MRI, but the one that I pulled off, off the internet. Um, so it was, an, it was a 11, 11 millimeters by 13, so considered as a macro. Um, which is unfortunate because they, they don't necessarily um, have the best surgical outcome, but in my case, it, it worked out well. My results, so my IGF-1 was, actually it was higher at one point, I, I don't know where that number came from, but I think it got up to about 800 the first time I had it done. Um, prolactin levels were 
little bit on the higher side, glucose, uh, blood sugars were all high, and uh, growth hormone levels, as you can see, quite high. And that last number should have suppressed down to, at that point, 1, 1.0 but it stayed up at 10, so that was pretty much the confirmation that uh, uh, macroadenoma, growth hormone secreting tumour was what we were dealing with. So I started on sandostatin uh, three times a day, and uh, that was pre-op just to try and soften the tumour and, and make it more manageable for surgery. A uh, little funny thing about giving the injections, so as I've already told you, I'm a nurse and I've been giving injections for, gosh, many years. I've given thousands of injections. I've put in so many lines and I love giving other people injections. <laughs> Do you think, because I'm good at it, not because I'm, a, you know, not because I'm nasty or anything, I'm just really good at it. Um, but. I could not give myself an injection. It was, it was kind of, you know, now I'm, I'm not the nurse anymore. I'm not in control. I am the patient. And, and that kind of switching hats like that, it was harder than I can imagine. Like, harder than, it's ridiculous even saying this out loud that I can't give myself injection and I love giving other people. So my poor husband, as he watches me go, okay, one, two, I can't do it, and then another one, and then I end up stabbing my thumb instead of my belly, and, and then him saying, just give me the needle, I'll do it, and he's like, but you haven't even practiced on an orange or anything, and he was very good at it, and I actually got all my colleagues to take turns, hello. I thought the sandal satin was an intramuscular shot in your butt. So, there is a, a short acting sandestatin? Oh, there is. You there is. Yeah. But you have to give it every three times a day. Oh, it's okay. it's a lot shorter acting in it, but for initially, because the sandestatin la, the, the long acting one, takes, it's a slow, they wanted, because of the tumour hemorrhaging, they wanted to slow down the action, so okay. the, the quicker acting was the way to go initially. Okay, so I did one. go onto the, the long acting um, after a couple of months on the, the short acting. Okay, so the short acting is not intramuscular, it's just... It's subcutaneous. Okay. So, and I had plenty of that, the, the, <laughs> the subcutaneous, but didn't help me in the process of giving the injection. What size needle? Um, oh, the, the tiniest that I could find. Like, it isn't one that solidifies or, you know, kind of concrete is uh, like the, the lard, but uh, we were trying to get the tiniest needles possible and that wasn't really helping. Yeah, I'm a big wuss. Um, so after a month of Santostatin, um, some changes. My, uh, my IGF-1 was coming down, my growth hormone a little bit coming down, my blood sugar came down dramatically. It was really good. Um, after two months, again, more more improvements. Um, I was still getting occasional shooting pains, but they were definitely not as bad as they had been, so that was a relief. And I was sleeping better without snoring. That was another thing. My, my dear husband is, you know, I'm getting all these diagnoses in the sleep apnea, and I said, John, did you ever hear me stop breathing through the night? Like, did you ever, you know, did you ever notice anything? And he's like, well, yeah, I noticed that a few times, but you always started up again, so I wasn't so worried. <laughs> he's a gem. It's just as well he didn't come to this talk, isn't it? <laughs> so um, I had my surgery in 2006, um, and transphenoidal, the common approach. And the surgeon said that it would take uh, an hour and a half to two hours. Um, Dr. Gentilly, he does uh, the majority of the surgeries in Ontario. So he's very experienced and very good. So um, the surgery actually did take a lot longer. Um, my poor husband waiting in the, the waiting room. Uh, three hours go by, four hours go by, five hours go by, and he's starting to really worry. The surgeon um, 
came out with beads of sweat and basically <coughs> said, Mr. Van Nostrand, your wife is fine. Um, it's just she has an exceedingly thick skull. Um, to which he responded, Oh, Doctor, I could have told you that a long time ago. <laughs> he's, he's lovely. So pathology, um, actually, I'm not sure if you guys know what your pathology was. I don't know if you got into the details, but usually the, the tumour is made up of one kind of cell. Mine was strange. It was two types, um, which doesn't really change anything as far as the you know, treatment or outcome, but it was just an interesting little... <coughs> I'm rare, and then I'm even rarer, which doesn't surprise too many people that know me. Um, so post-op, uh, nothing really uh, dramatic about my post-op. Uh, I was feeling a bit rough for about five days and then started to feel like a new person quite quickly. Um, so I had some residual health problems, sinus infections, headaches, heart issues. I had some heart arrhythmias, um, which were being monitored by a cardiologist, but that was probably when my heart was shrinking. So going back into a normal kind of size and sent it off uh, doing some odd stuff. And I was threatened with a pacemaker, but managed to talk the doctor out of that one because I just bought a body fat scale, like one of these weight scales that does your body fat measurement that, because I'm a triathlete and uh, I'm obsessed with that, and right on the scale, it says, do not use with pacemakers. So I absolutely did not want to have a pacemaker. It was, uh, would have been a waste of $200 <laughs> for the scale that I couldn't use. So um, I also had a bit of a... Um, a thyroid uh, mass uh, which was biopsied um, and they are watching that it, it, they couldn't get any good tissue to get a good sample but uh, it is being monitored over the years and every now and then I have to go for an ultrasound or a biopsy um, so I also um, as part of the, the follow up oh sorry yes so 13 days after my surgery, I was back on my bike. This isn't 13 days after my surgery. This is a, a few months later in a race. I went back to the gym and I was back on my bike and I was feeling like I had energy beyond words. Mm -hmm. Energizing Com battery? What's that? You felt like the energizing battery? I, I felt, you know, I, I, I did. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was given a new body because I could see better you know my, I used to have blurry vision I had um, I couldn't taste my food as well and my just everything you just I couldn't feel things as much but now everything was a lot clearer I was sleeping better so I had more energy um, it, w it was just everything felt really good and the pain wasn't so bad and the headaches had gone and so I'm very lucky, and I, I realised that uh, six weeks after my uh, surgery, I had my IGF-1 te checked, and it was normal, and that was great. Uh, sleeping well, um, decreased ring size, decreased shoe size, and uh, MRI showed that it looked like it was clear. So every six months, as I mentioned earlier, is what my endocrinologist orders. Um, and then after five years of, of good results, then we go down to once a year. And um, colonoscopy. So because of the increased risk of um, colon, colon cancer. Um, now this is something when doctors uh, who don't really know acromegaly don't really appreciate how important it is to have extra testing so my endocrinologist was very insistent that I go for a, a colonoscopy and I, I go it was normal first time around 
So then five years later, I go again to see the same gastroenterologist, and he was adamant that I did not need another colonoscopy because I was normal five years ago and I should just wait 10 years. And I, thankfully, because, I mean, as a nurse, I, I can kind of push a bit harder, I think, and, but I think that as patients, we need to push, we need to, you know, be our own advocates and ask for things. And if we don't get what we want, we have to be a little bit of a squeaky wheel because I insisted nicely that, you know, I explained my endocrinologist really wants me to have a, a colonoscopy every uh, five years because of my higher risk of colon cancer. Reluctantly, this uh, gastroenterologist let me have my colonoscopy. It's not like I really wanted a colonoscopy. I wasn't doing it for, for fun, that's for sure. Um, and it turned out that she did have polyps, which could have been precancerous and, you know, five more years along the line. Who knows what would have happened then? So really, uh, you know, note to self, just squeaky wheel. Um, regular breast ultrasounds and, uh, and mammograms and the thyroid testing on a regular basis. I was afraid that actually the, the growth hormone was the thing that was uh, keeping me going with my triathlon stuff. Um, I was afraid that actually that was what even started my thought that I could even do a triathlon. I thought all this extra, you know, kind of hormone that got me, me going to, to exercise. Um, but a year after my surgery, I finished. And I finished way faster than I had ever finished before. So I didn't need that growth hormone after all. It was a, a real, it was such a relief. Um, and that was in Lake Placid. And I've uh, done that race a few times now. Um, so what can you do? Um, and this is what I spend a lot of time doing is talking to, to patients. Um, don't be afraid to, to ask questions. You know, it's your body. You have to look after yourself. You have to. You're more aware of yourself than anybody else. And as much as doctors do have your best interests at heart, you sometimes wonder that. So it's it's really important to push for what you need. Um, when you go to your doctors, be prepared. Have a list of questions. If you need, feel the need to bring somebody else with you, you know, if you don't feel as confident to, to ask the questions, bring somebody that can. Um, and, you know, research. Uh, I think you want to have the best doctors, and, and it's sad to say, but sometimes the best doctors don't have the best bedside manner, but um, <laughs> I'd rather... Uh, a kind of crusty, you know, kind of very straightforward and, and uh, serious, impersonal doctor than a than a doctor that doesn't know what he's talking about. So, it's kind of that, you know, balance. Um, and who prefers, pre performs the most surgery? You want a surgeon that's that's got lots of experience. If if surgery is a an option for you, and again that you know the squeaky wheel gets oiled. Just keep asking. Keep advocating for yourself. Um, and another thing I think as patients, as family members of acromegalic patients, um, it's important for us to spread the word and tell our story whenever we get an opportunity. Um, you know, the more people that know about it, the, the more of a chance that somebody's going to be diagnosed earlier than perhaps it took you guys to be diagnosed. Um, just another little funny story. My mother-in-law is blind. She was at her hairdressers about f three years after I'd had my surgery. And she has very good hearing. She uses her other senses to the max. So she's listening in on the conversation 
at the next hairdresser's chair. And the next hairdresser was uh, talking about her mother and how she's got all these health problems and diabetes and sleep apnea and arthritis and, and you know, she's got these terrible headaches and, and you know, her feet have grown. And, and my blind mother-in-law turned around and said, that sounds like acromegaly to me. Your mother needs to go and see an endocrinologist. And wouldn't you know, that woman ended up having a pituitary tumour and um, having surgery and, and actually is doing phenomenally well. So, you know, it's kind of sad that it takes 10 years when people are going to doctors all the time and, and, it, and it's a, a little old blind lady at a hairdresser's can pick up your diagnosis. You know, it's like the, the, you can't see the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest, which I don't know which way it goes around, but um, just really interesting kind of example of, of something being right in front of you and you're just not figuring it out. So I think that it is very important. I tell my story everywhere I go. I told the guy on the plane last night, uh, yesterday afternoon when I was coming back from a trip and uh, he, he was... I think he was interested, he didn't fall asleep, so you know, I'd say that was a good thing, but um, I just think the more people that we tell, the the better chance that we're gonna, and I, I always, when I go to my uh, dentists, I, you know, I've had a couple now, because I kind of left the dentist that uh, I was seeing, and now I go and I, I try another dentist and if I don't like them. But I tell them and I tell podiatrists particularly because it's podiatrists that are, are going to see issues. It's, it's dentists that are going to see issues. I even tell the people at the specialty shoe store, you know, because people like us will be walking into these specialty shoe stores and saying, I don't fit into my shoes, I don't know what happened, my feet grew. And I've, I tell the staff, you know, if you ever have anybody say that, tell them to go see their doctor and to say that to their doctor. Because you don't tell your doctor these things, you tell the, the shoe store person. Um, so I think it's really important that we just, you know, tell people. And I don't think it's boring, I think it's pretty interesting if you have a rare disease and you can tell people about it, you know, and I don't think that most people would find that boring. Um, there's a lot of people doing work on our behalf to try and lobby for better access to drugs. I don't know if you're familiar with CORD, the Canadian Organisation for Rare Diseases. They are doing work behind the scenes on a governmental level to uh, lobby for, for better coverage um, and you know on a personal level you can let a right to you you know member of parliament um, again that squeaky wheel there's uh, organizations like true to me there's a website patient support and advocacy um, and then Pfizer um, and other drug companies that are working hard to to get the the medications out there um, and available to everybody uh, without you know having to, you having to beg and and you know suffer because you're not getting the best treatments that you deserve and need finally my last slide so I believe in following my dreams and, and I sometimes have dreams that potentially might never come true. But last Saturday, I was in Hawaii. They're going to start crying <laughs> because the Ironman World Championships where it's like the top triathletes in the world. I got there. And that's me at the finish line a week ago. And I just, you know, so I, I'm kind of so happy to be here. So happy to be there, you have no idea. Um, 
it was almost my longest Ironman ever. Like it was, I mean, time-wise, it was my slowest, but it was the most amazing, uh, the best, the most incredible. And, and I can't believe that I came from that couch potato person with a brain tumor um, to finishing the, the toughest race in the world, apparently, and, and uh, to be racing with the best in the world and, and to have beaten a few of them as well. <laughs> but um, that is, is basically my story. Um, and it, it isn't done yet. Like, I've got lots to do. And, and uh, you know, I am writing a book. And this is just one chapter. There's lots more. And I tell you, I'd be here all day if, uh, if I was given half a chance. But uh, anyway, I hope you have enjoyed listening to that. I hope you've learned something. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.